Amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 33 for our study tonight. And as we come to this 33rd chapter of Jeremiah, you will remember that Jeremiah finds himself in jail. He's in jail because he simply did what God bid him to do. He filled Jeremiah's mouth with his words. He sent him to Zedekiah the king to speak. And well, Zedekiah didn't take Jeremiah's message too kindly. And as we saw in the opening verses of chapter 32 last time, he had Jeremiah thrown in jail. I wonder, have you ever done a right thing, a good thing, and suffered some nasty consequence for doing it? If you have, well, you are in good company. For it was Jesus himself who spoke these words in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. I can't help but wonder if he wasn't thinking of Jeremiah when he said that. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And maybe you're one sitting here this evening that knows what that's like. To do a good thing, to do a right thing, only to suffer consequence for doing it. That is exactly where Jeremiah finds himself. And as he is sitting in jail, I'm sure that he's probably wondering, God, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, I do what you tell me to do, and I get busted, and I locked up in the slammer for doing it. And I can't help but wonder if maybe Jeremiah was, was well, a little discouraged, a little doubtful, a little despairing, when we see beginning in verse 1 how the Lord comes in some powerful ministry to his prophet. Notice beginning in verse 1 of Jeremiah 33, moreover the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying thus says the Lord, who made it, the Lord who formed it. And the it that's being referred to there are the heavens and the earth that Jeremiah acknowledged in the last chapter that God was the creator of. And so the Lord is saying, Thus says the Lord who made the heavens and the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Note this, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Now get the picture in your mind tonight, saints. The armies of Babylon are encircled around the city. They are camped out waiting to destroy Jerusalem. In the meantime, Jeremiah is locked up in the Huskow. Man, he's nailed in the slammer. Things are looking pretty desperate. Things are looking pretty bleak. When in the midst of all this darkness comes this glorious invitation from God. When he says in verse 3, call on me. Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And I can't help but think that that same invitation is being extended to you and to me here this evening. Has there ever been a time in your life when maybe you were a little perplexed about what was going on? A little confused about your circumstances or situation? Wondering, God, what are you up to? When he invites us to call to him. For he promises to answer. But you see, I have found, at least in my own life, maybe yours too, that sometimes I just, well, I fail to call on him. I fail to pray. I fail to seek his face. In fact, I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle James over in the fourth chapter of his New Testament epistle, where he says, you have not because you ask not. God here promising not only to answer, but to show us incredible and great things. I wonder how many times we deprive ourselves of those wonderful revelations of God 
simply because we don't bother to call on him. You have not because you ask not. Reminds me of the story of the pastor whose little kitten had gotten stuck up in a tree. And after several futile attempts to try and get this little kitten out of the tree, the pastor finally came up with this brilliant idea. So he threw a rope over the branch of the tree and he tied the other end of the rope to the back of his automobile and he began to slowly inch forward and sure enough, it was working. He was pulling the branch down to within arm's reach. When he puts the car in park, steps out to walk back to the tree, when snap, the rope breaks, the branch flies, and this kitty is airborne. This flying feline now going across the neighborhood, never to be seen again. Well, little did the pastor know that around the corner and up the block, there was a little girl who was praying and praying and praying asking God for a kitty of her own when suddenly one sunny afternoon out of the middle of nowhere came this kitten with outstretched paws landing right at her feet. You have not because you ask not. God says call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I trust that that is in part one of the reasons we're gathered here this evening. We want the Lord to show us these things. We want the Lord to speak to our lives. We want God to reveal these things to us. For the things that he's talking about here in verse 3, that he will show us great and mighty things which you do not know. Listen, saints, they're not things that you can learn from a textbook. Neither are they things that you can learn from the classroom. But these are things that are revealed by the Spirit of God. These are things that God gives to us through supernatural revelation and knowledge. Knowledge. These are the things that God wants to show us. Maybe you're going through a hard time right now. You're not really understanding what the Lord is up to in your life. But I'll bet the last hard or difficult experience you went through, you can look back and say, Oh, God. So that's what you were doing. He's preparing us. He's equipping us. He's enabling us to be those ambassadors of His grace, His mercy, His love. He wants to show us these things. In fact, I've shared time and again, saints, that I believe God wants you to know His will for your life more than anybody else around you. We sometimes think that His will is like that little shell game where He just kind of, you know, pulls the old switcheroo and He's like, now guess, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. No, God wants to show us these things, but again, we need to do what he bids us to do, and that is to call to him. What comforting, encouraging words these must have been in the midst of the dark, bleak days that Israel, that Judah was in the throes of. Ready to be destroyed, ready to be conquered, ready to be hauled off as prisoners of war. Thinking that they were done with. When God says, oh, just call to me, I'll answer you. And so Jeremiah goes on in verse 4. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah, which have been pulled down to fortify against the siege mounds and the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with the dead bodies of men, whom I will slay in my anger and my fury, all for whose wickedness I have hidden my face from this city. Now, again, you can't help but sense the desperate conditions that the people are facing here. Verse 4 tells us how they are literally pulling down their houses. They're tearing down their houses to fortify the wall of the city against the invading Babylonian army. I mean, these people were desperate. They were willing to lose the roof over their head to try and, and provide some form of security for the city. And as they are tearing down their houses to fortify the city, to fortify the wall. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with dead bodies because you see, they missed the bigger picture. They weren't just fighting the Babylonians, they were fighting against God. 
You see, it was God who had determined this judgment against them. It was God who had brought the Babylonians to come and to conquer the city. And we've seen how there was a great disparity in the message of the prophets. Jeremiah's was the lone voice at this time saying, Surrender, capitulate, give in, and you'll be spared. When the rest of the prophets were saying, No, we're going to beat them up, man. We're going to chase them out of town. We're going to destroy them. And so all the people of Jerusalem were rallying behind the false prophets and the false messages and they were fighting against the Babylonians only to be destroyed, only to be killed. Because again, they were so out of touch with God that they failed to see the bigger picture and that is that it was God himself they were fighting against. God had determined this judgment against them. It was God who was using, as we've seen before in the book of Jeremiah, the Babylonians as his, as his rod of reproof, as his scourge of judgment. And as they sought to fight against the Babylonians, they would be destroyed. They had missed the fact that their fight was against a power of force much larger than any earthly army. But God continues in verse 6, and he says, Behold, I will bring it, speaking of Jerusalem and Judah, I will bring it health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return and rebuild those places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then note this verse 9. It shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all nations of the earth, who shall hear all the good that I do to them. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I provide for. Now, don't miss what God's saying here. Fresh on the heels of his pronouncement of judgment and destruction against the city, he's saying, I'll heal it. I will restore it. And I will rebuild it. You see, we, we find here what I believe to be a, a fundamental biblical truth, and that is that there are times where God has to tear down, where God has to destroy in order to rebuild. And what these people experienced historically, you and I sometimes experience in our lives personally. There are strongholds, there are, there are areas, there are issues in our life that God has to overcome, that God has to destroy, that God has to cast down. And as, as those areas are just allowed to be destroyed by the Spirit of God, then He turns around and He rebuilds a beautiful, marvelous, majestic work. You see, that's the kind of process that sometimes goes on in our life. And it's the kind of work that even as we see here in verse 9, it is a work that as others see it, it is something that will be worthy of praise. You see, that's what God is saying. As God destroys the land, as God levels Jerusalem, as, as they're restored, as it's rebuilt. I mean, notice that. Right on the heels of the pronouncement of judgment, God reminds them, I'm not done with you. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow in your future. We are going to meet again and there will be some restoration go on in this place. But as the city is restored, we see how it will be an object of praise to the Lord. As God destroys and rebuilds, it will be to His praise, to His glory. And the same thing is true of your life and mine. The work that God does in our lives is a work to His praise and to His glory. Amen? I mean, that is exactly what our lives ought to be, is a testimony to others of God's transforming and working power to take someone who used to be and make us what we are today. You've heard the expression, I'm sure, that God loved us so much that he didn't, oh boy, I just lost that train of thought. God, God saved you just the way you were, but he loved you too much to leave you that way. That's the thought. Came back to me. Senior moment, but you know what? It's still coming back. Thank you, Jesus. True. He saved you and me right there in the slime pit that he found us in. 
but aren't you glad that he loved us too much to leave us there? He's done a glorious work of transformation in our lives. And it is a work that as others see that work, I don't know what your experience has been. I know a few of your stories. As people have seen what God has done in your life, they step back and say, Great Scott, Martha, there is a God in heaven. You know? That's been their reaction to me. You know, high school reunions are kind of a, a funny thing. I, I have never gone to any of mine simply because, you know, we, we, we've moved now about 10 hours away from where they would be. But I just got my 30th, if you can believe it. They just had my 30th high school. Oh, man, I'm getting old. Some of you are older still. I know that. <clears throat> But as, as, as I sent my card over again, as I did from the 25th and the 20th, and oh my, they just keep growing on you, don't they? I, I, get, I get emails from people, and I get notes from people saying, you're a what? We can't believe that you're a preacher. I mean, none of you, praise God, knew me in high school, but that would have been the last profession, vocation that anybody who knew me would have guessed me to be doing. There were a lot of other things, but not this. Again, a testimony to his praise. That God can take a life and so radically transform it and change it that when people see where you are today and remember what you used to be, there's nothing but praise God. There's got to be a God in heaven. And that's exactly what the Lord is saying here in verse 9. Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and honor before all the nations of the earth who shall hear all the good that I do. You see, as they hear, as they see, and then they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness, for all the prosperity that I provide for it. Thus says the Lord, verse 10. Again, there shall be heard in this place of which you say it is desolate, without man, without beast, it should be heard in this place, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man, without inhabitant, without beast. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom and of the voice of the bride. The voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. You see, again, we've been noting that as Jeremiah has been described as the weeping prophet because his message was one of doom and gloom, death and destruction, now God is filling his mouth. God is, is taking his message and saying, hey, yeah, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be taken away captive, but there's going to be a rebuilding, a restoration that goes on. And he lets them know that while the city may lay in ruins, while there be, may be nothing but a pile of rubble, hey, there is going to be joy. There is going to be the voice of gladness restored to this place. I'm sure that had to even be music to their ears, for as we noted in a previous study there in the book of Psalms, it described what the Jewish heart was experiencing during this Babylonian exile. It said there how they had hung their harps on the willows, for there was no longer a song in their heart. These people were crushed. These people were discouraged. They were, they were broken, as it were. But God is saying, hey, folks, it ain't over. Out of this pile of rubble, there is going to be restored a glorious city that will be filled with the mirth and the merriment that you once knew. The voice of joy, the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom. For I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 12. In this place which is desolate without man and without beast... And in all its cities there shall again be a dwelling place of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. You see, that would be evidence of life. That would be signs that, hey, there, there, there's livelihood going on there again. The flocks are beginning to mill about the, the, the landscape. The shepherds, as we go on in verse 13, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the south, in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, the flocks shall again pass under the hands of him who counts them, says the Lord. We get a little bit of an insight into the life of a shepherd there. At night, typically, commonly, what the shepherd would do is round up the flock and, and herd them into a cave or maybe some other kind of place where they could be contained for the night. And it says there that he counts them. That reminds me of our good shepherd, 
who we're told will leave the 99 if he's missing the one and go and find that missing one. You see, the Lord counts his flock. His care is tenderly extended to you and to me. And again, God is reminding his people that though the land is barren and desolate now, being destroyed by the Babylonian armies, in this place which is desolate, without man, without beast, there shall again be a dwelling place of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. You see, because these shepherds and their flocks would be signs, would be evidence of life. As we were traveling from Vaughan, Turkey, down to the Iraq border last month, a little over a month ago now, we were in some very, very desolate stretches of countryside. Now, I told you the one experience we had about being detained at the Turkish military checkpoint for two hours, the guards were saying, why are you going this way? We want to get to the Iraqi border. Why are you going? We, we just want to get to the Iraqi border. It wasn't until after the fact that we realized that the route we had chosen to get to the Iraqi border was a route that was, was very desolate and was filled with armed guerrillas and militants that were out to overthrow the government. They were preying upon not only military convoys, but anybody that would pass by to steal, to rob, to loot. Little did we know what lurked in them hills. But as we were going down these long, desolate stretches of highway, suddenly out of the middle of nowhere, right there on the road in front of us, would be this huge flock of sheep, just crossing the road, grazing or whatever. I mean, no mini-marts, no gas stations, no hogans, no mud huts, nothing for miles around, and yet out of the middle of nowhere, here's this flock of 100, 200, 300 sheep, and one or two little Bedouin-type shepherds out there tending the, the flock. And all we can conclude is, there's life. There's life in this place. That guy's got to have a house. He's got to have a family. There's got to be a fence or there's got to be some place to, to store the sheep. And that's the idea that God is trying to communicate to his people here. This land which is desolate will once again show signs of life. Behold, verse 14, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. I hope that word branch in your Bible is capitalized. It ought to be. And we'll comment why in just a moment. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely and this is the name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness for thus says the Lord David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel nor shall the priests, the Levites lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually Again, in the midst of this dark, bleak episode of history in the nation comes one of the most dramatic, glorious promises of God as he now speaks to his people through the prophet that there's coming a day when this branch of righteousness will be established. Speaking of the Messiah... Speaking of the coming Redeemer and Savior, a day in which we read in verse 16, Judah will be saved, Jerusalem will dwell safely. A day in which he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord, our righteousness. How incredible it is as you study the prophets, both major and minor, that it seems that in the midst of some of the most dark, difficult times come forth these incredible, bright, optimistic, beautiful promises of the coming Redeemer, of the Messiah. We see here how he is described as executing judgment and righteousness in the earth. These are days in which Judah will be saved. Now, I hope you know, folks, that these verses are speaking about the coming of our Savior. 
but they're speaking about events that he will complete, that he will accomplish, not at his first coming, but at his second. Because you see, what we read here in these verses are often what's responsible for tripping up the Jewish mind in their understanding of the Messiah. As, as they would read these verses of the Old Testament describing how he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Well, when Jesus came, did he do that? Did he overthrow the Roman government? Did he establish righteousness in the land? No. He got sideways with the top religious leaders of his day and ended up being executed, crucified for it. And worse yet, in probably one of the most demeaning, ignominious ways, for the law says that cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And that was exactly what they did to the Son of God. And so this is why the Jews, even to this day, stumble over the prospect that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer. He didn't do what they understood the Scriptures to say He would do. Because they don't understand that at his first coming he came as the suffering servant of God. But at his second coming he comes as the glorious reigning king. He comes to execute judgment. And he comes to establish righteousness in the land. And Romans reminds us that the eyes, the minds of the Jewish are blinded to that fact, are blinded to the prospect of the, of, of the Messiah. But there's coming a day, I believe, very soon where their eyes will be open. And we've talked a little about that last Sunday. We'll talk a little further about it this Sunday in our study of Second Thessalonians. Where the Bible says that they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. And they will mourn over him as an only son. They will come to a recognition, to an acknowledgement that the one that they were in part responsible for crucifying 2,000 years ago was in fact the one that the scripture spoke as their redeemer, as their Messiah. But you see, they didn't understand that he would come as a suffering servant at his first advent and that he would execute judgment and righteousness in all the earth at his second coming. And so God continues in speaking through the prophet here, For thus says the Lord, verse 17, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, to sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there will not be day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on the throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not considered what these people have spoken? Saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen... He has also cast them off. Thus they have despised my people, as if they should no more be a nation before them. And thus says the Lord, If my covenant is not with day and night, and if I had not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servants, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captive to return, and will have mercy on them. Okay, what's God saying here? Come on, come on. What's God saying? Simply this. As God has promised that there would be a descendant of David sitting on the throne. A covenant. A promise. He says that the only way this promise, this covenant would ever be broken. Is if the day was no more. If the night was no more. If the coming up and the setting of the sun was no more. Only then would my covenant be broken? In other words, he appeals to nature. He appeals to that which goes on every day. There's never been a day yet that the sun hasn't come up, that the sun hasn't set down. And God is saying, just as sure as that is, so too is my promise that David will never lack a descendant upon the throne. You see, child of God, the promises of God are yea and amen. 
They are sure. You can bank on them. Now that the election is over, all of the political rhetoric is done, and thank God Pastor Brian's jokes and stories are on the shelf for another four years. We're tired of hearing things promised that we just knew were too good to be true. Things that the politicians would say to try and cater to our vote. What's fascinating to me, and maybe you've been listening the days following the election, the commentary on Bush's opponent. I've been listening to Democrats roast their own candidate. I mean, a pretty sad commentary when you think about it. Because you see, the promises of a politician are not yea and amen. They're not sure. And though I believe our current president has great intentions and a visionary future for our land, I wonder if everything that he promised, as with all of his predecessors, will be fulfilled. You see, the only one whose promises are sure is God himself. And that's what he's communicating here. He's saying that my covenant, my promise is as sure as day and night itself. Going on, chapter 34. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion, and all the people fought against Jerusalem and its city, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And you shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into his hand. Your eyes shall see the eyes of the king of Babylon. He shall speak to you face to face, and you are going to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, you shall not die by the sword. You shall die in peace, as in the ceremonies of your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so that they shall burn incense for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have pronounced the word, says the Lord. Now, folks, this is, this is incredible. By the time we come to chapter 34, it's maybe... A year later, from the events of chapters 32-33, we saw in chapters 32-33 how Jeremiah was um, speaking the word of the Lord there in the 10th year of the reign of Zedekiah. We know from history that Zedekiah ruled 11 years before the city was destroyed and he was taken away captive to Babylon. Jeremiah was thrown in prison in chapter at the start of chapter 32, but now here in chapter 34, he's no longer in jail and the Babylonians are conquering so it seems to be some months, maybe even a year later from the events of chapter 32, 33. Here's my point. No sooner does Jeremiah get sprung from jail and God sends him right back to the same king who threw him in jail with the same message that landed him in jail the first time. You follow me? I mean, either Jeremiah had a screw loose or he was a man with some kind of guts. I, 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 I put myself in his shoes and I wonder, what would I do in his situation? I mean, I finally get released from jail. I'm like, thank you, Lord. That, that was one miserable experience. And then God says, hey, Jerry, I want you to go to Zedekiah and I want you to say this and to say that and to say that. He's like, whoa, Lord, I just said that and it got me landed in jail. What are you doing? You hate me? You're trying to kill me? Destroy? What, what's up with this, God? And he does it. What an obedient heart. Even as we were talking recently in last Thursday night study about this whole subject of faith, stepping out in faith, doing that which doesn't necessarily make sense to you at the time, but God will later make it clear to you. It takes obedience. It takes faith to do that, doesn't it? God, what are you doing? Sometimes we miss the work of God because we're waiting for an answer rather than stepping out by faith and obeying the voice of the Lord. You see, what's remarkable is Jeremiah does it. And by now the situation in Jerusalem is so deteriorated that Zedekiah doesn't even bother with him. Doesn't throw him in jail. Doesn't have time for his message. But old Jeremiah is faithful and obedient to the Lord. And so he goes and he tells the king... What God tells him. 
And he says, Zedekiah, you're not going to die by the sword, but you're going bye-bye to Babylon. He says, you're going to see the king face to face. Now here's what's fascinating. You students of the scripture, we commented on this previously. Jeremiah's contemporary was a man named Ezekiel. Ezekiel was prophesying at the same time that Jeremiah was. Jeremiah, of course, was here in the land of Judah, would later on end up down in Egypt. Ezekiel, on the other hand, was prophesying from within the Babylonian captivity. And here's what Ezekiel was saying about Zedekiah. Ezekiel was saying, Zedekiah, you're never going to see Babylon. And here's Jeremiah saying, Zedekiah, you're going to Babylon. And so Zedekiah is probably thinking, well, you prophets of God, get your act together. One of you tells me I'm never going to see Babylon. The other one of you is saying I'm headed to Babylon. Well, one of you get right with God. It seemed to be contradictory. It created some confusion. And yes, it probably even caused Zedekiah to discredit the prophets of God. But here's what's fascinating. They were both right. They were both right. Ezekiel said, you will never see Babylon. He was right. Jeremiah said, you're going to Babylon. How can that be? Simply this. If you know the story of the captivity, you know that when Babylon finally breached the wall as Jerusalem was crumbling, Zedekiah made a run for it. Looked like he was going to get away. But the armies caught up to him. Brought him back to Nebuchadnezzar the king, where old Nebi slaughtered his sons, Zedekiah's sons, before his eyes. And then put his eyes out so that that would be the last visual image that he would ever remember. Ezekiel was right. He never did see Babylon. Because he went there blind with his eyes out. Jeremiah was right. But you're going east, king. He was hauled away a prisoner. You see, again... When people point to the Bible and say, no, it contrad no, it doesn't, just, you know, God, God has the answer. Don't worry about it. He doesn't make mistakes. And so we see again how Jeremiah presents this word to Zedekiah. The armies are, are surrounding the city now. Verse 8, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were in Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them. Notice that every man should set free his male or female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should be kept a Jewish brother in bondage. And now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into this covenant heard that everyone should be set free or should set free his male and female slaves, that no one should keep them in bondage anymore, they obeyed and let them go. So here, here's, here's an incredible emancipation proclamation, if you will. I mean, as the Babylonian armies are now breaching the wall, they're coming into the city, they're ready to destroy and to conquer. Suddenly, the word of the Lord comes from, from Jeremiah saying, Hey, hello. I think it would be a good time for you to let all your slaves go free. You see, they're going to need the manpower to try and, and face the Babylonians as they're coming into the city. You'd have to understand that under Jewish law, if you were in debt up to your eyeballs, like some Americans are today with their credit card limits, and you were unable to pay your credit, unable to pay your debt, what you could do is sell yourself into slavery. Under the Old Testament Levitical law, you could sell yourself as a slave to try and work off or to pay off your debt. You know, we kind of make jokes about that in a restaurant, right? You know, we don't have the money to pay the bill, so can I wash dishes? You know, that kind of idea. Same, same mentality there. You can't pay your bill, sell yourself into slavery. The Jewish law was that you would serve for six years. In the seventh year, you were to be set free. But here's what was happening. Just as they had neglected so many other aspects of the law, they had neglected to set their slaves free in that seventh year. And so God is saying, basically, let my people go. It's time to release them. It's time to set them free. The Babylonians are camped outside the wall. They're about to conquer the city. Hey, what do you need slaves for in a time like this? And so we see there in verse 10 how they obey and they let them go. But notice verse 11. But afterwards, 
they changed their minds and made the male and female slaves return whom they had set free and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves. Get that. No sooner did they let them go and they rounded them back up and enslaved them all over again. Why? What happened here that made them change their mind? Verse 11. Well, history affords a little bit of insight. As no doubt they were peeking over the wall and they saw the Babylonian army growing and growing. By the way, that's interesting. Back in verse 1 of this chapter, we're told that it wasn't just the armies of Babylon, but all the kingdoms of the earth under the dominion. Remember that? It wasn't just the Babylonians that were camping out on their doorstep, but now every day they'd look over the wall and they're like, oh, there's another kingdom, oh, there's another nation, oh, the army's growing. And they were really beginning to start feeling outnumbered. And so when the word of the Lord says, hey, let my servants go, they're thinking, okay, God, <laughs> we'll do anything to please you right now because our goose is cooked. The armies are right there. When one day they wake up and look over the wall, and they're all gone. Where'd they all go? Well, history tells us that right about this time, the Egyptians began to make a move on Babylon. The Egyptian army was coming to square off, to face off with Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And so what Nebuchadnezzar and the armies do is they pull off of Jerusalem. I mean, they already know Jerusalem's just a matter of time. It's a pushover. They've had the city siege now for quite some time, and, and it was just a matter of time before it went down. So they pull the armies off, and they go to fight the Egyptians. And the Hebrews look over the wall, and they see all of their adversaries, all of their enemies gone. And they're thinking, happy day. We've been delivered. And catch this. Rather than give thanks to God... We read in verse 11 how they go right back to their old ways. You see it there? Now, folks, that fits in so beautifully with what's just happened in our country this past week. Are we a people that are going to thank God for what's gone on in this ele election process? Or are we a people that are going to go back to our old ways? Because, listen... I was there. I was in the community-wide prayer gathering. We saw people turning out and praying for this election like never before. We saw record numbers. Oh, I know. I stood in line for three and a half hours to cast my vote. Record numbers turning out. I think it was Randy that shared with us how, what, five million religious, four million religious right people showed up in the voting boxes that didn't show up in the in the previous election. What was the popular vote lead that Bush had that was record setting, they said? 3.8, 4 million? Who do you think that came from? Now don't pat yourself on the back, but I believe that God had a definite hand in this election. And so now that it's over, and now that we've got four more years, as, as they're chanting in D.C. or wherever. Are we going to be like these people and go back to our old ways? Or are we going to continue in that spirit that God was stirring in advance of the election, where people were praying, and people were interceding, and people were on their knees, and people were crying out to God, and people were involved, and people were active, and there was life. Or are we going to go back to sleep as a church? You see, even as I preface the service this evening, when Jesus touched those ten lepers, man, every one of them was healed. But only one bothered to stop and come back and thank him. These people neglected to do that, but went right back to their old ways we would do well to learn a lesson from them that we not repeat their mistake but that we really would be like that one who came back with thanksgiving in his heart 
and thank the Lord for His goodness, for His grace. Because as we read the following verses, because they changed their mind, because they went back and they enslaved their brothers and their sisters. We're going to see from verse 12 that God wasn't real happy with them for that. He says, Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, let every man set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him, and when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me, nor incline their ear. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight, every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Then you turned around and profaned my name, and every one of you brought back his male and female slaves, whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure, and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slaves. Do you hear the heartbreak of God over their action? Again, as they are facing certain doom and gloom, they respond obediently to the Lord, but the moment their day brightens up even a bit, the armies are gone, it looks like, hey, we've been delivered, they go right back to their old ways. Now, I wonder if you may not know somebody like that. Somebody whose marriage is in a mess, and so they cry out to God, and they say, God, I'll do this to save my marriage. And then the next thing you know is their marriage starts to turn for good, and they go on with their life and forget all the promises and, and covenants and beggarly pleas that they made to the Lord and just go back to the way they used to be. Be careful not to do that, child of God. Be careful not to cry out to the Lord in the midst of adversity, promising and purposing, resolving to do something. And then the minute He delivers you, the minute things are, are, are looking bright and good in your life, you go back on your word. That's what they had done. And so look what God says to them in verse 17. Therefore thus says the Lord, You have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and every one to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. That's interesting. We don't do that today. But back in Old Testament times, they had a really interesting way of sealing a covenant, sealing an agreement. What they would do is they would take an animal and they would cut it in half. A goat, a lamb, in this case, what, what, what's it described here in this case? Um, a calf, yeah. They would cut it in half and the two parties would pass through it. Walk down the middle of the two half sections of this animal. And that was evidence of sealing or signing or agreeing to this covenant to this agreement. In our day, praise God, it's become much simpler. In some cases, and culturally speaking, it's often just a handshake, huh? Let's shake on that, brother. And that, that seals it, that, that agrees it. And this is the way they used to do it then. And so God is saying, I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two. So, so they, they shook on it, man. They, they, they signed it. They agreed to it. I will give to them the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies shall be for meat for the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth. And I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princess into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life, and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which has gone back from you. Behold, I will command, says the Lord, and cause them to return to this city. They will fight against it, 
and take it and burn it with fire and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant the people are dancing in the streets they're partying hearty oh happy day we've been delivered good times have come and God says you broke your word man that agreement that we had you reneged you broke it and those armies that you no longer see camped out on your doorstep guess what Judah I'm bringing them back and I'm bringing them back with a vengeance they're gonna destroy this city they're gonna burn it with fire child of God the lesson is clear from this chapter at least to me and I trust to you tonight as well and that is let's be people of our word Jesus put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount let your yes your yea be yea and your nay be nay anything else is sin let your yes be yes your no be no be credible be trustworthy be a person of integrity when you say you will do something or not do something then either do it or don't do it don't renege don't change your mind not only is that true in our interpersonal relationships but child of God that is especially true of our relationship with God for it is he who spoke back in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 when he says there it's better not to vow than to vow and not pay or not do in other words it's better not to tell God you're gonna do something and then not do it don't even tell him you're gonna do something don't even go there because God wants us to be people of our word and if there's one thing in these last days especially in a country like ours where we don't take each other's word as worth much do we we sign contracts we sign documents we have them notarized we have them sealed we have them you know approved and all the rest because we don't trust each other and it was fascinating to me I don't know what the figures were I heard in the thousands of the lawyers just a couple of days ago that were ready to make all these legal challenges at the snap of a finger man the Kerry camp the Bush camp whichever side you were with man they had their legal team ready to go into action at the at a moment's notice because we are a people that sadly have developed to the point where you can't trust your neighbor you can't trust one another and yet Jesus is saying whoa as a child of mine as a Christian that better be different in your life you better be a person whose yes is yes whose no is no even with your kid you know my kids have come I, I'm almost humiliated embarrassed to say they've come to realize that a maybe more likely than not is dad's excuse for no you know dad can we do this maybe I know what that means really let's be yes or let's be no let's be people of our word let's make a difference in the days in which we're living that will stand out as a distinctive a distinguishing mark in your life and mine that we belong to Jesus Christ let's be those people of integrity and of honesty and that are trustworthy let's pray will you stand with me as we pray tonight